important it is to vote, and that voting is such an extraordinary right and privilege we have as Americans. Voting is something sacred. Yesterday, I felt that very personally out there with hundreds and hundreds of people at my polling site and obviously hundreds of thousands around the city who have participated in early voting. I felt the passion of the people that I was with who cared so much. They would stand in line no matter what to vote. It was something powerful. You could feel how much people cared, how much they wanted to make a difference. You could feel the hope that comes from that. Folks were patient, they were positive, they were supporting each other, they were determined to vote. That's the good news. The bad news is, for all of us, it was an extraordinarily frustrating experience to be in a line for hours it shouldn't even have existed to begin with. There should not have been a situation where New Yorkers were forced to wait hours and hours for early voting. We're not talking about Election Day. We understand sometimes there's a huge number of people who show up at the same time. We're talking about early voting. The whole idea was to make it easier for people and be ready to make it a positive experience. And that's what we did not see from the Board of Elections. Uh, people waiting three hours to vote is unacceptable. It means for a lot of people they simply won't be able to give that time. They'll run out of time. They, they'll have to be at an appointment. They'll have to be at work, whatever it may be. It's another way where we lose the opportunity to encourage people to participate. And we can't have that. So the Board of Elections needs to act further. I do see they took some action, and I appreciate that, but they need to take a lot more action. There's still time to increase the hours for early voting further, to get more machines over to the poll sites, to get more workers over there. There's a chance to get it right, especially for this coming weekend, where we would expect a huge turnout. So I'm calling upon the New York City Board of Elections to get it right, to go farther, to do more, to make sure early voting really works for the people of this city. With that said, I want to offer my thanks to the the folks who do the incredible work at the poll sites. I saw a lot of familiar and friendly faces in my neighborhood yesterday, the folks who work inside the polls, who really give their all to make sure that voting does work for people. The mistakes of the Board of Elections should not be in any way held against the good people working at each poll site who really want to help, who really care, who really are constantly, I saw people asking questions, looking for direction. They were great. The people who worked at the polls were great. I salute all of them. I thank them. But to the leadership of the board, it's time to do better. And you can act immediately to make sure this weekend is a success story and not another story of frustration. Now that's what should happen immediately to improve early voting. And by the way, the more early voting works, the better things go on election day itself. I expect there'll be a massive turnout on election day. But the better early voting works, the more and more people choose to vote early, the less you have a problem on election day. You relieve some of that pressure on election day. That's a good reason, a practical reason, and a good moral reason to get early voting right. But let's face it. The fundamental problem is the Board of Elections. I wish that the city of New York had direct control over the board. We do not. Uh, it's something that needs to be re-examined immediately because the Board of Elections structure simply doesn't work. It's arcane. It's from literally another century. It was built for another time. It was built on the wrong concepts for what we need today. So I want to suggest three specific actions that could be taken uh, to address this crisis. Because it's not just the lines we experienced yesterday or this week. It's every single election there's been a problem with the Board of Elections. It must be changed. First, the legislature should immediately pass Senate Bill 2726. That bill would allow for the professionalization of the Board of Elections uh, in its current form. Now, I don't think the current form makes sense, but the least what we could say is an immediate action that could be taken would be to pass this legislation to professionalize the board as it's currently structured, to empower the executive director to run it as a more modern agency. Uh, this would be a step forward. I've been advocating for this bill for years. Lots of uh, good government groups have been fighting in Albany. 
This would be a first step and it could be taken immediately by the legislature. Uh, second, we need change, profound change ahead of next year's mayoral election. This is gonna be a crucial election. We expect very high turnout. We can't experience what we've been experiencing here. Uh, I call upon the legislature and the governor to examine a different kind of model, staying within the concepts laid out in the state constitution. Consider a model that still allows for the representation by political parties as is required, but works with a different kind of board and a different kind of staff. And a model that we can look at here in the city is our campaign finance board. It is not perfect, and I'll be the first to say many elected officials can tell you things that didn't work so perfectly with the campaign finance board. But what we can also say is it is a modern professional organization. It is not patronage based. A board of uh, leaders makes decisions and then there's a professional staff that executes those decisions uh, in a modern way that actually looks a lot more like a good functioning uh, government agency than what we see at the Board of Elections. Something like that could be put in place for the next election within the constraints of the state constitution. And that could really help us to have better elections in New York City next year. And then finally, the third point, the larger solution, we need a New York State constitutional amendment. The New York State Constitution literally says that boards of election have to have representation and leadership from the political parties. I think that's a broken system. You look around the country at the places that are regarded as having really good, strong election systems. A lot of the states on the West Coast are examples. Colorado is a great example. Uh, they do not have a system based on party affiliation being the decisive factor in who leads and who staffs their boards. Uh, they have systems that are much more professional and much more transparent and lead to better elections. But we're going to have to change the state constitution. That is a difficult process, but it can be done. We need to change the state constitution so we can have a board of elections that actually functions. We just can't have people, th you know, finding that their name is taken off the voter poll rolls. They can't, they can't find out where they're going to vote. They wait in line for hours. We can't have this anymore. So we need that bigger change. Look, if we work quickly, we can make improvements ahead of the elections of 2021 and then bigger improvements after that so that really everyone can participate fairly. Okay, now let's go back to what we talk about every single day. The fight against the coronavirus and what it has meant for this city. Look, we all know we're in the middle of a health care crisis, and we all know all of you have played a heroic role in fighting it back. But we also know that this crisis has had a huge impact on people's lives, not just in terms of their health, but in terms of their livelihoods. We have seen so many families lose their livelihoods. We've seen so many people lose their jobs. We've seen so many small businesses struggling to survive. It's been an extraordinary challenge. And what we found is we need to find new solutions. We need new ways to help everyone. And I want to focus on small businesses that have been through so much. Um, for us to bring back and protect our small businesses, we have to do some different things. And a great example, and it was one that, you know, we had to learn by doing, was with our open restaurants program. There was an example of cutting a lot of red tape doing something that hadn't been done before, offering opportunity for restaurants to use outdoor space, bring back their employees, turned out to be a big hit, turned out to be something that really works for New Yorkers. Let's apply that same idea to small businesses, retail businesses all over the five boroughs that so much need additional business to survive, but it's hard to do if you have a small space and restrictions in place. Let's liberate the outdoor space for them as well and help these small businesses to continue. So today we announce our open storefronts program modeled on what worked with open restaurants and open streets. Here's an opportunity that'll reach over 40,000 small businesses in this city and will allow them to sell their wares outdoors right in front of their businesses to have a lot more people able to come and buy, to be able to expand 
their staff, the number of people they employ. We're going to do it the same way we did with open restaurants. A simple application, very little red tape. We want to cut through the red tape. We want to make it easy for people to move forward. And that people can, store owners can go online right now and start applying nyc.gov slash open storefronts and have an opportunity to get this going immediately and so important to have the ability to have a lot more business ahead of the holidays. And everyone knows this is such a crucial time of the year for every small business. We want them to be able to maximize it. So we're making this opportunity available right now. I want you to hear from two people. And the first of them is a small business owner. She has a great story of someone who built her business from scratch, uh, who had a dream and made it uh, come alive, uh, but also is dealing with all the challenges right now and needs new opportunities to keep her business going and to employ people from her community. My great pleasure to introduce to you Rosanna Medina. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Commissioner Doris, for this opportunity. My name is Rosanna Medina, and I'm the owner of Fast La Grignua. It's an undergarment so it's on the on the garments business that seems to enhance the beauty of the women's empowered. So, and uh, we believe that every customer deserves to feel unique and authentic. This is why we work on some shape as um, reducing postpartum, post surgical. And as a Latina, and, in, and as a Latina and Tour, I went from carry my luggage along the Grand Concourse to open a storefront in the Bronx and Washington Heights. In the Bronx and Washington Heights, with the help of my husband and my daughter. Like many other retail businesses, the pandemic caused me to close down all my stores and operate sales online. It was very difficult, but with the help us of SBS, we be allowed to apply and receive the PPP loan and legal services. I know, like many, many other retail businesses, the pandemic you know, caused us to do that situation. In June, we decide to reopen our store following the city social distance and the help of regulations. But the biggest, the biggest challenge was finding a way to accommodate our large clientele in our store. And I think and I believe the storefront program will be a huge, a huge help for us, it will allow us to proceed more transaction. We allow us to sell my shape wear, my merchandise as well. I'm excited to continue to sell all my products in a safe and in a safe environment and in a good way. Thank you, SBS, for all the help you have given to us. We will continue to count on you and the city's support to economically support this pandemic. So I hope that Storefront Program can be too. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Rosanna. And congratulations on building a great business and fulfilling your dream. And now uh, I hope that this new initiative is going to allow you to really expand the business, get more people hired, bring in more customers, uh, and, and I hope you thrive with this open storefront system oh. we put in place. Oh, thank you. And now I want you to hear from our Small Business Services Commissioner, Janelle Doris. And uh, look, I want to say Small Business Services has really done an amazing job reaching out to small businesses, offering help of every kind, listening to small businesses, and thinking about new ways of doing things. And Janelle was a front and center in the effort to create uh, the open restaurants and open streets efforts. 
uh, and been one of the driving forces behind this notion of reimagining public space, thinking differently about what we have done because this crisis is telling us we have to do things differently all the time. More creativity, less bureaucracy, more outreach and support for small businesses. That's what Janelle and his team have been doing. So my pleasure to introduce to you Small Business Services Commissioner Janelle Doris. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor and Rosanna. Wow, what an amazing story um, from carrying your luggage on the street to owning uh, two store fronts, both in Washington Heights and in the Bronx, employing uh, nine uh, New Yorkers and bringing uh, opportunity for those families. We, this is what small business services is all about. We are here to assist our small businesses to get the resource they need to really advance their dreams, but also reach their potential and really bring our city back. We cannot come back fully as a city without our small businesses. And so we're excited about this program, our Open Storefronts program. Uh, listen, throughout this pandemic, our small businesses have been uh, showing their tenacity and their drive. They've been showing their grit, that New York grit that they have. And certainly, we want to make sure that we're here as the city to support them. And we have done that. Uh, we're certainly uh, looking forward to this program. Uh, and it's just going to add to our open restaurants program, which is amazingly uh, popular and uh, a lifeline for our uh, small businesses. And this program will be the same for our retail uh, facilities, particularly now as we go into the holiday season when uh, these small businesses have 70%, 70% of their sales come from this time. So we're making this more accessible. We're making it, uh, giving them the opportunity to get out uh, in front of their stores and also uh, engage their customers, do transactions right in front of the store, and also uh, allow them to free up space also inside, uh, really, uh, to keep it safe and keep the traffic moving as we need to. So. If you are a small business, uh, we want you to know that SBS will continue to be here for you. Uh, you can reach us at our hotline at 888-SBS4NYC. Uh, we have helped uh, scores of uh, small businesses, either with financial assistance or our hotline, uh, which we've already helped 42,000 small businesses to answer questions that they need and, and the like. So listen, if you need resources from us, if you need assistance, from Small Business Services, or to understand better this program, please feel free to reach out to us. We will have our mobile unit uh, across all five boroughs. I'm going up to the Bronx today. We're very excited about it. We'll be on Southern Boulevard, and we will continue across the five boroughs to bring uh, the resources directly to our small businesses uh, for this particular program, our Open Storefronts program. So once again, our, uh, our uh, telephone number, if you need to reach us by our hotline, is 888-SBS4NYC, or you can reach out to us for all of our resources at nyc.gov forward slash business. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for all that you and your team are doing. And this new initiative with Open Storefronts, again, going to make a difference for tens of thousands of businesses. A lot of their employees are going to have new opportunity and, of course, a lot of customers who can't wait to come back to their favorite businesses. So let's make it official with this executive order. There you are, Commissioner. I commend you. There is democracy in action right there. Thank you so much. And as we uh, finish talking about open storefronts, I want to remind people again, holidays are coming. Uh, great opportunity to patronize your local businesses. Look, everyone, we all appreciate this amazing stuff available online, but let's really double down on our local businesses here in this city. Let's give them the business they need to survive. Uh, we really hope and pray that this pandemic will be addressed by next year with a vaccine. This is going to be the toughest year for small business. This holiday season uh, is something they really need to be good and strong for them. But we all can make a difference by buying local. So please do that. And since we have a guest with us, Rosanna, tell us again, Fajas La Grenua. Tell us, the, tell us where you're located again. Okay, this is Fahala Green. We are located at 55 West, 101st Street. This is in Washington Heights. And in 133 East in front of Row and the Bronx. All right, so for all those folks looking for a great place to do some holiday shopping, <laughs> Lozana and her team are ready for you. Exactly. Excellent. <laughs> Thank welcome. you. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, let's do our daily indicators. Number one, daily number of people admitted 
to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. The threshold is 200 patients. Today's report, 105 patients with a confirmed positivity level for COVID of 22.8%. Number two, new reported cases on a seven-day average. Threshold, 550 cases. Today's report is 552 cases. And number three, percentage of people testing positive for COVID-19 citywide, threshold 5%. Today's report, 1.39% with the seven-day rolling average. Again, that's 1.75%. That's a number we've been very close to now for the last few weeks, 1.75%. Say a few words in Spanish. Los pequeños negocios son el alma de nuestra ciudad. Y sin ellos no sería la ciudad más diversa del mundo. Hoy anunciamos un nuevo programa para que estos negocios tengan acceso al espacio público y la gente pueda comprar de forma segura. Juntos vamos a imaginar y hacer realidad una nueva ciudad y dar el ejemplo de cómo se recupera la ciudad más grande de América. With that, we will turn to our colleagues in the media, and please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. Hi, all. We'll now begin our Q&A. With us today, we have Rosanna Medina, Commissioner of Small Business Services, Janelle Doris, Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson, DOT Chief Oper Operating Officer, Margaret Fordrione, Senior Counsel for Democracy NYC, Laura Wood, and Senior Advisor, Dr. Jay Varma. With that, we'll start with Rich from WCBS 880. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Rich, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Just uh, so this, in this new proposal you have for the uh, outdoors, presumably, and the sidewalks, will there be a series of rules? And are you going to allow tents and that sort of thing so that people aren't going to get wet by and whatever it is out there? Um, let me start, and then I'll turn to... Uh, Commissioner Doris and uh, the Chief Operating Officer for DOT, Margaret Forgione. Um, look, Rich, what we want to make sure is we're maximizing space, but obviously also being smart uh, about keeping people safe. So the perfect world is where you have more space and the advantage of the open air. Um, think about the shopping experience, a lot of uh, what people do, they don't necessarily have to take a lot of time to look at stuff. It's not like sitting down for a meal. Uh, we've had plenty of great examples of people shopping outdoors in the city in a lot of ways. So we want to make sure uh, it's safe. We want to make sure there's a flow of air, um, but also give a lot more space. And I think we can strike that balance. Commissioner. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, businesses can um, erect temporary signage. They also um, can use uh, umbrellas that are collapsible uh, to protect them uh, from the elements as well, um, and also uh, tents. But at the end of the day, uh, the business would have to bring this equipment back in. Um, we believe that uh, the way that we've constructed it and also the way that, uh, as the mayor mentioned, as it's easy as it is for you to sign up, should take a few minutes. Uh, the rules are very straightforward uh, and it sort of aligns with uh, what businesses are already selling inside. Essentially, they bring it outside. So this is very, very, very simple uh, process. Um, and just like our, we do with our open restaurants program, again, to make sure that it's accessible for our small businesses. Let's get the COO of DOT into this. Margaret, what, what would you like to add? Good morning. I would just like to add that the most critical thing is that each business must maintain an eight-foot clear path for pedestrians to pass by. We have to make sure the sidewalks are still unimpeded while allowing for this new use by businesses on the sidewalk. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Rich. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, just wondering uh, about the Steve Cohen's uh, proposed deal to take over the Mets and use City Field. Uh, has the city come to a conclusion about... Uh, uh, whether or not it will allow that to happen. Uh, Rich, the city law department is reviewing that transaction. They're doing their due diligence. I think they'll be w finished with it very soon. Uh, at the point that the law departments come to a determination, uh, we'll announce that publicly for sure. So I'd say some point in the next few days. Next is Marcia from WCBS. 
Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is sort of a follow question to your open restaurant announcement today, open streets announcement today. I'm wondering, a lot of restaurant owners um, are chafing at the fact that they can only have 25% of their uh, tables indoors. I wonder at what point you might be able to move that to 50%, which is what happens in all the other suburbs surrounding New York City. Marcia, that's obviously ultimately a decision the state will make. We're going to be working with them very closely. Um, we're all, the city and state together, watching very, very vigilantly uh, what's happening around the country where we're seeing a horrible uptick of this disease. And uh, we've had challenges here in the city, obviously in Brooklyn and Queens, although that situation is better. You still see the overall impact when you look at our daily indicators. So we're watching very carefully health leadership of both the city and state are talking to each other. Um, I think the state's idea is to come to some initial thinking about that over the next week or so. Uh, but again, as with all decisions on whether to expand or contract activity, it should be based on the data and the science. Go ahead, Marsha. Just a follow question. So I'm hearing from you, I think, that you're concerned about increasing the number of people who can eat indoors because of the possibility there could be a second wave and the increase in the number of positive test rates? Uh, Marcia, absolutely. Number one thing I'm concerned about right now is stopping a second wave in New York City. Uh, this city, look, to have been the epicenter of the crisis, fought all the way back to become one of the safest places in the country, now threatened with a second wave that's, you know, fully affecting so much of the country. We can't let that happen here. So we have to be really smart about the choices we make. And the state ultimately decides, but I think what we're all aware of, and I know the state feels the same way, is we cannot allow a second wave in New York City. Next is Dan from WABC. Dan? I spoke with some small landlords who say they're experiencing more than 50% vacancies during the pandemic, and they don't see that changing anytime soon. The Small Property Owners Association says hundreds are having a difficult time paying their mortgages and their property taxes based on rates from two years ago. There has been some help for renters in New York City. What, if anything, is being done to help building owners survive moving forward? Look, um, we need a, a bigger uh, type of support uh, for building owners, for renters, for small businesses. Uh, all of them deserve relief. This is a global pandemic. It is no one's fault. Everyone deserves help uh, to find a way through. That can only come in one form, which is a federal stimulus. Now, look, in six days, we're going to know the most important thing, was who wins the election, the presidency, the Senate. That's going to, I think, determine how and when there will be a stimulus and how big it'll be. But I believe that stimulus should uh, work to make whole everyone so that we can restart our economy and move forward. That's the only place it can happen. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. You good? Okay. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Yoav from the city. Hi, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I think a caller asked you Friday about um, fitness studios not being able to open yet. And just wondering what, what the plan is for that, uh, because that sector is, is still struggling. And as far as I know, hasn't been able to open yet. Yeah, it continues to be discussed with our healthcare team. We're not there yet. Um, for the very same reasons I talked about a few minutes ago, we do have an immediate danger of a second wave in New York City. We fought it back so far effectively. And I want to thank all New Yorkers because everyone's been a part of that. Folks in Brooklyn and Queens and some of those affected neighborhoods have been a part of that. They went out, they got tested in record numbers, they're wearing face masks, it's making a huge difference. But we are not out of the woods. So any of the issues still to be resolved uh, in terms of reopening or expanded opening has to be looked at through the prism of the healthcare situation. Uh, and so we're going to be very careful to make sure uh, there is no uh, continued danger of a second wave before we make a lot of new expansion decisions. So that's going to be based, again, on the data and the science, Joav. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, I guess along the same lines, you know, when when, when you heard that, that your barber shop was closing, you said we need to, you know, see what we can do to, to stop this kind of stuff. And, and here today, you're announcing that stores that are already open can expand. So I guess the, there doesn't seem to be the same kind of urgency and, and creativity being employed for a, a sector of, of the um of the industry, the commercial space, that, you know, it, it's almost November and they still haven't been allowed to open. I'm just wondering about people's livelihood and why there either isn't more urgency and or creativity to, to figure out a, a solution other than just to say they have to remain closed. I disagree with your assessment. There's tons of urgency, but the urgency is first and foremost about protecting people's lives and keeping this city moving forward and keeping our economy growing, and we have to stop a second wave to do all that. Yoav, I would simply say it's first things first. The first mission is to stop a second wave. Or if you have a second wave, a bunch of things are going to close. That's against everyone's interests. So I disagree with you. There's lots of urgency and there's lots of creativity. This is why we're talking about something like an open storefronts initiative to bring stores that can do their work outdoors, outdoors and give them the right to do it. Because a crucial factor here is outdoors versus indoors. I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Varma, who I think speaks passionately about this. Look, what I've learned from our healthcare leadership, outdoors versus indoors, huge factor. Uh, where people can wear a mask versus where it's less likely or less effective to wear a mask, huge factor. Uh, when you think about something like fitness studios, I want them to come back, but we have to bring them back when it's safe and when it makes sense. And they unfortunately are indoors and they come with challenges that we have to address. But this is all about the big picture, which is stopping a second wave. Dr. Varma, could you speak to that? Yes, thank you very much. I, I think the mayor has, has highlighted a lot of the, the critically important issues. Uh, one of the areas that makes us particularly concerned about group indoor fitness activities is the fact that it's been associated with uh, fairly large outbreaks uh, that have been well documented in other parts of the world. Um, most recently, there was a, a large outbreak associated with a, a group fitness class in Canada. Um, there's a very well documented one that's happened in Korea. So it's, it's one of the many reasons that gives us pause, particularly than all of the issues that the mayor has highlighted. Uh, there was a, a, a dramatic resurgence of this disease uh, throughout the rest of the United States um, and throughout Europe. And so there will continue to be a lot of, of pressure for us to be able to keep cases down here in New York against that. Um, so additional activities um, that are known to be potentially high risk um, are, give, give us a lot of pause. Thank you very much. Next, we have Julia from The Post. Hey, Mr. Mayor, how are you doing? I am well, and Julia, I want to wish you well. I know you'll be uh, off duty for a little while, but I hope everything goes beautifully, and we'll see you back soon. Thank you very much, and uh, good luck continuing to steer the city through these difficult times, and I wish uh, you and your family stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so last night we saw some protests in Brooklyn over uh, the police shooting in Philadelphia. Of a, of a black man and um, the protests, you know, were not peaceful. We saw vandalization of police vehicles, a torched American flag, lit garbage fires, um, shattered windows of local businesses. I know there were some arrests made by the NYPD. I'm wondering if the city will push for prosecutions. And do you have any different approach um, from how protests were handled in June? Um, or is it kind of the same, uh, same approach that you took then? No, we always are trying to learn and do better, Julia. Absolutely. Um, a lot of what happened in June was peaceful protest that was handled well by everyone, by protesters, by police. Um, that was the vast majority of what we saw. There were situations where there was unacceptable violence. There were situations where some police officers made mistakes and did things that were unacceptable. Um, but let's not lose the forest for the trees. The overall reality was peaceful protest uh, that was managed and facilitated uh, by the NYPD. Uh, we want to learn from May and June, though, how to do things better, how to listen to concerns that have been raised and address them. Uh, this situation last night, I haven't gotten a full report. I'll be talking to Commissioner Shea later on. But um, 
Look, I want to make clear, no violence is acceptable. If there's violence towards uh, individuals, citizens, if there's violence against police officers, absolutely unacceptable. Violence against property, unacceptable. Fire is unacceptable. And of course, those offenses should be uh, prosecuted. And uh, I absolutely want to see those prosecutions. Um, so we, we just need to remind people, if you have um, issues you want to raise or concerns you want to raise, you can do that anytime with peaceful protest, but you cannot not uh, use violence against anybody or anything. Go ahead. Okay, switching gears to education here, um, we saw the results of a federal assessment test uh, for fourth and eighth graders. 73% um, um, of eighth graders were not proficient in math and 74% were not in proficient in English. Um, so those aren't, you know, the best numbers. I'm wondering um, if you think your administration is preparing kids to be, um, you know, proficient enough to graduate. And this is 2019, so pre-COVID. Yeah, Julia, I need to get briefed on those results. Um, some of the national testing in recent years has been uh, more accurate. Some of it's been less accurate. There have been some real issues about the consistency of the testing, but I need to hear about the details of this. I can give you a better answer. But look, what I know is this. We still have a lot of work to do uh, to improve public education in the city. I'm the first to say it. But I know for a fact uh, that we've seen over the last seven years our graduation rate go up really substantially. Uh, the uh, test scores on the state tests have gone up consistently. Uh, we're doing a much better job of closing the achievement gap, and we're seeing that particularly with youngest kids who have benefited from pre-K and 3K. We're seeing more and more kids uh, take part in advanced placement courses as we've made that truly consistently equally available all over our school system. There's a lot of signs of real meaningful progress, but there's definitely more work to do. So we'll take a look at these specific outcomes from these tests and have more to say on that soon. Next, we have Juan from New York One. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I wanna ask you about the uh, new program that you had just announced. How are you going to ensure safety? Are you gonna have more police presence? And uh, what would you say to drivers already struggling to find a a parking space and i'm talking about nypd presence because you're going to have all these businesses with all the uh items that they are selling outside on the street well let me have uh, again uh commissioner doris and coo forgione speak to you about this because the way this is structured i do not think is going to create the problems you fear um i think it's going to use sidewalk space more effectively and um people are gonna want it, I really believe. I think there's gonna be a real desire for people to go and take advantage of this opportunity to shop locally. I don't think um, it dredges up the kind of safety concerns you're uh, pointing to, but Commissioner, you wanna start? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so, uh, you know, we do agree, Mr. Mayor, um, you know, businesses will be utilizing right, the space right in front of uh, their stores. Um, so, you know, there is going to be a pathway for the uh, cu uh, customers and also pedestrians to pass. Um, we believe that uh, businesses, then employees that are normally inside will be able to come outside and work with the uh, customers so that, you know, if there's concern about, um, you know, uh, uh, crime, et cetera, I don't think we are too concerned about that because employees will actually be out there working with the customers. Uh, and overseeing their goods uh, and, and various services they're going to provide. Um, we have not heard in, in, in the lead up to this the concerns around uh, uh, safety in that context. Uh, we do have our bids. Um, who are we working with? Uh, business business improvement <laughs> districts as our partners. Um, we have 76 of them across the city that we're working with, our chambers of commerce that we're working with. Uh, to help those retail businesses uh, survive, but also really execute on this program. And we'll be tapping in to the, their resources as well. Hey, as we turn to Margaret, let's see, can we get the image back on the screen of the actual sidewalk layout? You guys have, let's see if our ACE team can get that for us so that when Margaret speaks, she is referring to the actual uh, schematic. Is that there? Oh no, the actual sidewalk, the look of the, there you go. Uh, Almost there. 
Margaret, we're going to set this up for you. Okay, Margaret, now, I, I don't know if you can see it, Margaret, but this is the schematic of how it would look with the sidewalk layout. Can you speak to that and uh, safety considerations? Perfect. So the focus of this program is sidewalk only. We're inviting the stores to come out and set up their wares on the sidewalk directly in front of their storefront. They can set it up for about five feet directly from the building, five feet out, as well as five feet high. As I mentioned before, at all times, um, an eight foot clear path for pedestrians needs to be maintained. In terms of the curb lane that you refer to, the only time a store will go out into the street is when the store is already part of our Open Streets Open Restaurants program, where the street is already being closed to traffic so that restaurants can come out. In those cases, the business can join in that format, but we think that the vast majority will just be sticking to the sidewalk directly in front of their building. So that being said, we don't anticipate a lot of safety concerns. The key thing, again, is to keep pedestrians moving, um, but you won't be seeing an impact in the roadway from this program. Thank you very much. Go ahead. So, Mr. Mayor, so uh, we, we've seen in the last few days uh, an increase in the numbers of uh, new infections in the city. Um, I, I, I believe that some of those numbers are going beyond the uh, line, the standard you had uh, uh, implemented in the past. What's a new metric that you're going to use? You know that uh, in the past, in New York City has been a little bit, uh, a, a few weeks after whatever was happening in Europe. And we see how Europe is doing so badly right now in reimposing lockdowns in many uh, European capitals and many uh, regions of the continent. What's a new metric and do you foresee similar actions being implemented in New York City as the ones that we are, we are seeing right now in Europe? Thank you. Very, very important question. So let me start and then I'll turn to Dr. Varma. I want to just go over these indicators really clearly in light of your question. Uh, we have three indicators and what we're most concerned about is when we see them all move in unison. Uh, the one that we've talked about several times the last week or two is the case number, which has now hovered right around that threshold several times the last week or two. But remember, that is also against the backdrop of a lot more testing than we've ever had in this city. Um, and we've been encouraging testing. So it's natural if you have a lot more testing, even if your positivity level stays low, you're going to have a higher number of pure positive cases. Uh, if this were happening uh, in concert with the other two indicators, we would be very concerned and we'd be taking additional actions. But because it is different from the other two indicators, uh, that has been determining our actions also because we know the problem was localized to a relatively small part of Brooklyn and Queens, and we've seen real progress in those areas. That's what tells us a lot. Also, the two other indicators on the hospitalization level still well below the threshold and with still a, a much lower positivity level for COVID than we saw in the spring. On percent uh, positive citywide, the seven day rolling average being the truest measure. Again, that has been in this area somewhere between 1.5%, 1.75% now over the last few weeks. It's been pretty consistent leveled off. We wanna push that down. But the big point here is, you know, we are making some progress fighting back the second wave. We gotta do a lot more. The concern about us being a few weeks behind Europe, I think um, that was when we didn't have all these uh, precautions in place and these strict rules in place. And also when there was a lot more travel interaction, there's obviously very little travel from Europe now. We've been watching this closely. But it doesn't reduce our vigilance. We're still really concerned that we're going to make our decisions very carefully. Dr. Varma. Great, thank you. I think the mayor has highlighted, uh, uh, you know, all the, the the real critical points about how we look at all these uh, indicators together with one big picture. Um, I would try to highlight maybe two points. One, just to explain a little bit about the uh, why we chose that uh, threshold of 550, um, kind of what it means to us, and then the second, a little bit about the context related to Europe. Um, we we chose that number of 550 after looking extensively. Uh, both at our data as well as data from many other places around the country that had different stages of reopening. And what we found was that um, there was often a consistent pattern when the increase in your number of, of cases uh, crossed certain thresholds, um, you know, compared to where you were at your lowest point, that that was a, a worrisome sign of a resurgence. 
Um, the good news of all of this is that, you know, we detected those resurgences in local parts of the city um, earlier than this indicator uh, uh, track. And so we were able to start taking actions. Um, of course, the bad news is that we're hovering at a level that we don't really want to be at. You know, we would love to ideally drive case numbers back to where they were in August. Um, but that is the origin of the indicator. It was, it was something to indicate to us that there's a warning sign that case rates might be increasing. Um, uh, over time and, and cause a second wave. Um, the second point briefly about Europe is that uh, we have done things that Europe hasn't done. You know, uh, Europe did have a lot of reopenings, and, and I think the issue of pandemic fatigue probably hit there stronger. Um, we've been really modeling our efforts after those successful large East Asian cities um, and taking action when we hit, you know, thresholds of like 2 or 3% um, in certain geographic areas for test positivity. In a lot of European countries, they have waited until their test positivity levels rose to much higher levels before they took action. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. We have time for two more. With that, we'll go to Ravain from Halmodia. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. I would like to ask you about special needs children who are particularly devastated by the school shutdown in the red zones. Uh, parents say that the children are regressing every day. I have a cousin who's a special needs child, and he calls me every other day saying, can you ask the mayor to open my school? I'm just wondering if it's possible Governor Cuomo may open them any day, but it's also possible that with a second wave, we may see shutdowns in the future. So I'm asking, would any special allowances be made for the uh, special circumstances surrounding the special needs schools and maybe allowing them to be open even when others are closed? Yeah, it's a very good question, a very important question. When we opened our public schools, the first thing we did was focus on our uh, school programs for special needs kids our District 75 schools, because unquestionably this is where uh, the in-person learning has the biggest impact and there's the greatest need. And I feel for the families for sure, they're dealing with so many struggles to begin with. Um, we have to be responsive to them. So the first thing I'd say is we're obviously waiting for the state's next round of decisions on the red zones. We've seen a lot of progress in Brooklyn. I'm very hopeful there will be some relief soon. Uh, and that will help address the problem. The state gets to make that decision. Uh, we want to make it carefully with them, obviously, but um, I am hopeful based on the sheer data we're seeing uh, that some relief is coming very soon. Uh, second, I think we do need to think going forward about uh, even when we're dealing with restrictions, do we have a different approach to uh, special needs programs because of the dire need? How do we do that? How do we protect those programs? What precautions do we need to put in place? This is a conversation we're going to have with the state uh, because I think this was something unanticipated that there was a particular need here that might have to be handled differently. Obviously, Ruven, this um, uptick happened very intensely. Uh, the most important thing was to stop it. I want to thank everyone in the community who has helped, everyone who's wearing a mask and social distancing, everyone who's getting tested. It's making a huge positive difference. So I want to thank so many community leaders, organizations, members of the community have really stepped up. It's been fantastic. The best thing to do is keep that going so we don't ever have to have restrictions again. But I think your point is fair. We need to rethink the approach to special education in light of the times when we need restrictions. Go ahead. Uh, there have been multiple reported instances uh, of summons being given to either schools that were closed, maybe had a few administrators in the building just doing administrative work. Uh, there was a, uh, an incident of a store that posted video of, a, of an inspector giving them a summons even though they were open only for curbside delivery. Um, and the inspector said, I'm, I'm just following orders. In the case of the school, the, uh, the inspector said, well, I have a list. And it seemed that she believed that there was a list to give summons to not to check if they were open. So I'm wondering if you're aware of these instances and uh, what is being done to prevent them in the future. I am not aware of those specific instances, but I want uh, anyone who's got information like that, if you could help us by uh, getting it to our team here at City Hall, we want to follow up on that. If someone was given a summons inappropriately, we need to act to address that and fix it. Uh, they should not be penalized if they're doing the right thing. Uh, they, if an inspector misunderstood the rules, look to be fair. Inspectors are being asked to adopt a whole new rules and do different kinds of work that they normally do. Some might uh, misunderstand a particular piece. We want to fix that. So I don't want to see anyone given a summons who shouldn't be. 
We know some people, unfortunately, have been overtly breaking the rules, and they do need to receive summonses. But if it's a mistake or a misunderstanding, let's see if we can address it and get us those details. We'll follow up right away. For our last question, we'll go to Michael from the Daily News. Morning, Mr. Mayor. How you doing? Good, Michael. How you been? I'm all right. A um, uh, couple of questions. The first one um, is a follow-up to Julia's question about the uh, protests last night. Has the driver of the car who rammed into police uh, at, at that protest been arrested? And, and why isn't uh, Commissioner Shea here today to, to feel uh, to field um, questions on this? It, it's it's kind of this is something that's come up in past press briefings. And I was wondering if you could address it again. Uh, again, uh, we focus on the topics that we're announcing each day. Um, Today, obviously, our focus is on this new open storefronts program, and I also wanted to speak to what's happening now, uh, such an important moment for this city and this country in terms of the election process. When there are specific issues, obviously, the commissioner uh, you know, talks with different media outlets quite a bit, uh, and the department will address that. But look, the bottom line is anyone who assaults an officer, that's absolutely unacceptable. There must be consequences. We'll make sure the PD gets you an update on that investigation right away. Go ahead. Uh, the second question has to do with open storefronts. And uh, yeah, I apologize if I missed something um, from Margaret before. Is it allowed on streets uh, or is it only allowed on streets when a, uh, an adjacent um, business has uh, an open streets uh, um, Permit, uh, could you just kind of detail that a bit more? It was unclear to me when you talked about it before. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, Michael. I'll start and turn to Margaret. Michael, I don't know if you are in a place where you can see the screen, but um, we have it back up. This is about uh, sidewalks. Um, this is, uh, it's different. It's inspired by what worked with open restaurants, but structured differently to focus only on sidewalks. The exception, of course, is when we have a whole street closed off because of open streets, then they, the stores can expand further. Margaret, you go ahead. Yes, Mayor, that's exactly right. The program is focused on the sidewalk, so the vast majority of stores will um, put their wares out on the sidewalk in order to participate in the program. If there is already an open street, open restaurant, on the block, they may join that. They may work with the partners that are already closing the street in order to um, come out into the curb lane. Thank you so much. Look, as we, as we conclude today, I just want to say a thank you to all New Yorkers who care about their city, care about their country, are out there voting right now. Six days till the election. I want to thank everyone who sent in an absentee ballot, everyone who is early voting, everyone who's going to go out the old-fashioned way on election day. Every bit of it's good and all of it is appreciated. I want to thank those good people uh, working at the polls, volunteering uh, to help out. Um, this city, we've seen it throughout. You know, people just step up for each other all the time. I want to thank everyone. When we sent out a call, when we tell people, go out and get tested. New Yorkers have done a great job of getting tested. Yesterday, we talked about the need for people to give blood and protect uh, folks who are in hospitals and protect our blood supply. People answer that call every time we put it out. New Yorkers just go out and make things happen, and they care about their fellow New Yorkers, and they do so much. And so I just want to thank everyone. This is why this city is coming back strong, because of every one of you who steps up and make a difference. And that makes a difference. And that, to me, is why I remain so confident about our future. And as we announce new opportunities today uh, for our businesses to be open and thriving during the holidays, again, help this city, help your fellow New Yorker, buy local, buy local this holiday season. It will make a huge difference. Thanks, everybody.